Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Marks Library. In observance of Juneteenth, USA Libraries is sponsoring this Lunch and Learn with Adam and Seals. The title is From Juneteenth to the Sky, African Americans in Meteorology. Before retirement, Alan served as the Chief Meteorologist at NBC 15 and WKRG TV in Mobile. He has authored three weather books, provided consulting meteorology services, and teaches weather broadcasting right here at the University of South Alabama. Without further ado, oh, one other thing before I set you off. We have a reception for Alan afterward in room 181 with cookies and brownies and tea. So I'll give you a chance to see and talk about his books so you can get more information from him. Um, without further ado, I'll see you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Juneteenth. Uh, I was out of town this past week at a weather conference. When I came back, I went downtown to Lupercalia, which is where, I'm, this is a roundabout way to start, which, which is where I have my weather photography on the wall for sale, and I have my weather books for sale. And I passed a young lady who was talking to her boyfriend. She said, what's the big deal about Juneteenth? And I held my tongue. I didn't have time to <laughs> give her the lesson that she should have gotten in elementary school, but didn't get. Uh, always an honor to be here. Always an honor to speak. Uh, Paula and Muriel roped me into this. <laughs> I'm not a historian, but I became one. Um, I was asked to speak, and I was thinking, well, should I talk about hurricane season? But it's a Juneteenth thing. And then, you may recall, uh, Senate Bill 129, which is the one that I'll summarize that says, don't tell people things that make them feel guilty about the past. And then it also says, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is not important. And that's when the light bulb went off that I had to talk about the history of meteorology. Because it's American history. So, uh, my books, I'm not selling them here today, but you can purchase them. Uh, the bookstore is supposed to have them by now, but also at Mobile Bookseller, uh, Lupercalia, uh, Haunted Bookshop. I have these cards, you can get these later. They have a QR code that shows you where to go, how to get them. And also, at the reception, in addition to happily posing for pictures with you, <laughs> From my photo book, and these are all, I've been taking photos since fifth grade. Whenever I get damaged photo books, which is most of the time, they're shipped from Tennessee and they're not boxed properly. When they're damaged, I get a credit for them, but instead of throwing them away, I rip the pages out and give them away. So I have pages, literally, you can take a page out of my book, and, I will sign it for you, and they're all double sided, and they're, they're, they can be framed. Okay, so from Juneteenth to the sky. A timeline of achievement milestones of African Americans in meteorology. This was a really cool project, which it's not done, but I'm done for now. <laughs> but as I get more information, I'm going to go back to it and continue. So I'm a meteorologist. Uh, I went to uh, Cornell undergrad, studied meteorology, majored in having fun. <laughs> then I went to Florida State University and actually learned meteorology, uh, targeting broadcast meteorology. And it wasn't until I was halfway through my college undergrad that I met the first other black meteorologists. And it wasn't until I was in grad school that I met a black PhD in meteorology. But I, I, it was a profession I wanted to do. It didn't matter. Color wasn't an issue or ethnicity. But it's just something where those of you who are the first in your field, you know that thing about being only, it rhymes with lonely, <laughs> but when you know that there are people behind you and in front of you, uh, it makes your journey a lot easier. All right, so every weather presentation starts with a weather map. This is not a weather map, it's an <laughs> army map, U.S. Army map from the 1860s. And we know that Juneteenth is the 19th of June, 1860. 65, 18 months after the Emancipation Proclamation, when word finally got to Galveston that the enslaved people were no longer enslaved. At that time, there was no National Weather Service, obviously no radar, satellite, any of that kind of stuff, no computers. 
weather reports were taken by hand, daily weather reports. There was no report in Galveston, but there was one in Houston. And what's really interesting, I know you can't see this, um, there's a note, there's a gap in the middle of the month where the weather observer made a note that they went to uh, Galveston. When they got back on the 19th, it's incomplete, but it was 87 degrees in the afternoon. There were a little bit of rain, 16 one hundredths, and then there was a mock sun in the morning. And the mock sun is what we call a sun dog. So it tells me there were cirrus clouds. And then there's a little note that says CC, which is uh, cumulus clouds. So it's a typical summer afternoon. What's more significant, the day after, see if the pointer works here. You should never try these. There it is. It says Yankee troops in town. So it's fascinating that typically that column is about weather, but this was historic, and someone made a point of noting that back then. Uh, so as I started my research, most of it I started online, and I was amazed to find all of these references from the 1880s into the 1920s about Negro weather prophets, about colored weather prophets, which is what you would call a forecaster. Um, and they were all throughout the newspapers. Now, I, I started to wonder, was this a thing where, and I'm going to interchange black, color, Negro, African American, whatever hits me while I'm talking. Was it a thing that black people had a magical power to forecast the weather? Or did they actually have a little more insight based on their roots in the continent of Africa? Or based on their avocation, well, I wouldn't call it an avocation, based on their duty to farm a field or to, to work as a blacksmith? Because that all of that is controlled by the weather. So maybe uh, African Americans were a little more in tune with the atmosphere. Uh, the other reason this was significant is uh, my great-grandmother, who was born in 1892, told me about her father, who was born toward the end of slavery, who people went to for weather information. And she always would joke about it. My father made a big deal about it, too. So I don't know. Maybe there's something there. All right, so let's go back to 1884. This, most of what I'm telling you, I didn't know two or three months ago until I started this project. 1884, William Hallett Green. He was, uh, I believe, the first black graduate of the City uh, College of New York. He graduated maybe, at, it may have been like at 19 or 20. He was young, he was sharp, he was, he was on the ball. And he was assigned by the uh, Army Signal Corps. So if you take the National Weather Service now, it used to be called the Weather Bureau in the 1940s and 30s. Before that, it was the Army Signal Corps. So he was assigned to go to the Pensacola office as a weather observer. And back more than 100 years ago, again, you weren't really forecasting weather, you were just taking observations. So he was the first colored weather observer, the first colored weather forecaster in the Signal Corps, and he actually became the first chief meteorologist of a Signal Corps office in Pensacola. But the story, unfortunately, is not that great. Uh, it starts off with his um, supervisor, uh, Sergeant McGuarren, protested to his superiors that if they were to bring a colored man into Pensacola, he would be ridiculed, the weather service would become the butt of jokes, and he went on to say, if, I don't, if you can read all that, that if he were permitted to serve here, it's actually the next one, so long as I am in charge here, Private Green will be in no way connected with the official duties of the office. So 1884, 20 years after the end of slavery, this qualified scientist was denied the opportunity because of the color of the skin. So that's a, that's a trend, it's a theme that continues, unfortunately, in some arenas. So this would have been, to me, this is really cool, that would have been one of the weather reports that William Hallett Green actually submitted to the Army Signal Corps. And that's again from the 1880s. This, was, this became a big deal. It went into the press, and it went all the way up to the Secretary of War, Mr. Lincoln, who is one of the sons of President Lincoln. And the Secretary of War said, this is what we told you to do, you better do it. And Sergeant McGuarren uh, 
should have been court-martialed, but they simply demoted him and moved him out of the office. And once they moved him out of the office, Mr. Green became the first known signal office chief. And that's the key phrase in all of this is known, because there's a lot we still don't know. Jump to 1889. <coughs> Uncle Joe Ballard. Joe Ballard was a weather prophet. Now, he was a blacksmith. He was a philosopher. But he was also known as a weather prophet in Salisbury, uh, North Carolina. He was also the chairman of his county's Republican uh, committee, which was interesting, for about six years. I had a really good uh, history teacher in, in high school, and my dad as well. In the 1880s, at, at the end of slavery, Republican was the party of black people. Things have changed. <laughs> okay, so Uncle Joe, um, weather prophet. If you think back to Uncle Ben, Uncle Tom, Uncle Remus, uncle was a common term. It was used mostly as a, a term of respect for older black men, but not always. But Uncle Joe had this issue where a fellow Republican from uh, north of the Mason-Dixon line wrote an editorial saying, it is not fair for a colored man to have more political power than a white man. 1889, Uncle Joe Ballard. Uh, he, he actually, there were a lot of postcards that circulated with his picture on them, so that really upset people, some people. Okay, you know about George Washington Carver. You think peanuts, you think potatoes, but think weather. He was a volunteer weather observer at Tuskegee University. These are his, for many years, these are his daily reports. And it makes sense that if you're going to grow something, you need to know the weather. So a lot of people don't think about him as being in the weather arena, but he was an observer. Not, not a forecaster, but an observer. 1899. Okay, this is the first one that blew me away. 1901, a colored weather bureau man in Mobile. If you're familiar with the National Weather Service located at the airport, to my knowledge, they, they had not had a black employee forecaster until about six years ago here in Mobile. But this one preceded him by a century. Uh, unfortunately, there's no name, and this is where I, I'm still trying to do research. I couldn't find any other reference to this 1901 Color and Weather Bureau man in Mobile. This would have been the office, the uh, customs house, customs house that he worked at. I think that building is gone, replaced by another one. 1901. Now, 1909, Alabama history. The Montgomery Advertiser had an article about Elijah S. Hardy. He was from Snow Hill, which is south of Selma, so it's between Montgomery and Evergreen. He was hired as a Negro from Snow Hill, Alabama. But notice this, what's highlighted here. He was stationed in Pensacola, Florida, but removed. And he was removed because he was incompetent, in quotation marks. So this sounds very familiar. This is, this is the pattern. Uh, and the article goes on to say, he will probably be found incompetent in Mobile as well. I'm not one for conspiracy theories, but that kind of lays it out right here. So it's, it's a, uh, not keyword, code word. On the left is an article from uh, the black newspaper that pretty much defended Mr. Hardy. It said that he passed the test, he's competent. He passed the official government test. But on the right side, unfortunately, we see that he was dismissed because he was incompetent. And that would be uh, Royal Street, where he worked. I think that building is gone also. All the buildings are gone. <laughs> okay, jump ahead to 1911. Lewis Marone Campfield in Savannah. Uh, the first thing that jumped out to me was the price of this, $7.50. Right now, that would be, this is a city directory. Right now, that would be $250. In 1911, to, to find out who lives in your city, you have to pay $250 now. The other thing that I thought was really cool is this basic thing that we learned in school. If you can't spell it, you can't find anything. If you can spell Campfield, you would have found Louis Morel Campfield, which turns out 
he was an assistant weather observer in Savannah, Georgia. Another, I had no idea. Um, and this made me stop and pause. He was, he was a descendant from two mulatto families. Mulatto, if you don't know, meant one of your parents was white, one was black. You were mixed race equally, if there is such a thing. Um, so then I realized that when I say, when you say African American, would he have considered himself African American? Uh, I have a lot of friends who their parents were from the Caribbean, and I don't know. We're forced to check these boxes when we do things, but a lot of us don't see ourselves with those labels that other people put on us. So that made me pause about using black, African American, colored, and Negro. So Campfield here. He was the assistant weather uh, chief in Savannah. And he's listed in this 1914 uh, uh, Weather Bureau Department of Agriculture list. Someone said, I need to see a list of all the colored employees in the Weather Bureau. At this point, it was the Weather Bureau. And at the bottom of the list, there were two of those people who were forecast, well, weather people, not supervisors or, or, or staff or custodians. There's Lewis Capfield, assistant weather observer, and beneath him is Oscar H. Hammonds. And the DO, it took me a month to realize it stood for ditto. It's an abbreviation for ditto. I can't read it. Like, what is do? What do you mean do? Uh, they made $1,080 a year, which now equates to about $34,000 a year. It's okay, I guess. Uh, but again, assistant weather observer, their primary job, literally, every hour, you take a weather observation. At the end of the month, you compile it, you send it to Washington, D.C., and then you do some other local research. They did minor, uh, like, today's forecast, tomorrow's forecast, but that would be all they could have done. All right, so Oscar H. Hammonds, remember that name. Because in 1920, Oscar H. Hammonds was the co-author on an article in Monthly Weather Review. And Monthly Weather Review is a, it's a, a world standard. It is what it says. It's the Monthly Weather Review for the United States. And all the different offices contribute articles whenever they have something significant. So there we see Mr. Hammonds, 1920. And this is in... Um, Summit, California, which is near Reno, Nevada. So here's our second weather observer. In 1934, there was an article that appeared about Reno having the only, so far as known, Negro weather observer in the United States. And if you can't see, that article was written by a guy named Langston Hughes. And I was like, wow. Uh, and apparently they were friends. Uh, on the right side, there's Oscar Hammonds. This is not his weather office. Those are his church members. <laughs> they were doing a play, so he was an actor as well as a, a weather observer. So he was in Reno for decades as the chief of the weather office there. More hidden history. Uh, it, also, you may notice I have a little timeline at the bottom, but focus on how many gaps there are in here. Okay, going into World War II, this was a revolution for uh, African Americans in the military. Uh, finally, uh, the military was desegregated in the middle of the war. Tuskegee, you, you probably have heard of the Red Tails, Tuskegee Airmen, but a lot of folks don't realize there was weather behind that. Just like now, you don't, no pilot takes off without a weather briefing. So Tuskegee had a weather detachment, and their job was to train uh, black meteorologists, their job was to brief the pilots, and mid-war, that's when uh, a couple of notable figures here, Wallace Reed, he was uh, the chief of the weather detachment. He later went into the Weather Bureau, he later, uh, I forget the timeline, became, I believe, the first African-American meteorologist in the Army, Beneath him is Archie Williams. And Archie Williams was a gold medalist in the 1936 Olympics. He competed with Jesse Owens. And then he became, of course, uh, a meteorologist. So tremendous amounts of history here coming out of Tuskegee and the great state of Alabama.
I didn't know this. This woman, Alice Hill, uh, in the late 1940s, the military, or at least the Air Force, finally allowed women to serve. She was one of the first women to serve, and maybe the first black woman, maybe, but she was definitely the, the first uh, black woman weather observer. And then she reached corporal, uh, a rank of corporal in 1951. To me, the coolest thing about this is when I look at that picture, I see my mother, I see my aunts, I see all these women who were intelligent and capable as I grew up. But I never saw this picture until just now. So it, to me, it makes a huge difference for those of us to see what we could be, literally to see it. Dr. Charles Anderson, 1960, he is the first black man to get a PhD in meteorology. Dr. Charles E. Anderson. Now that picture came from later in his life. He also served in Tuskegee. So there's a, that was a huge pipeline for where we ended up. He ended up, uh, his later career, he was associate dean at UW-Madison. He's a big deal. 1962, television. And a lot of people think of TV when you say meteorology, but TV is, this, is a very small part of it. Diane White became the first black person on TV as far, doing weather as far as we know. Now, she was not a meteorologist, but she was a weather person. She was in St. Louis, starting off as the Sunday night weather girl. 1964, Dr. Warren Washington, he became the second black man to get a PhD in meteorology. Uh, long list of achievements, he is still working and still doing research and still mentoring. Uh, so I, I know him, which to me is the coolest thing is to know these historical people. I hadn't met him until probably 15 years ago. So back to Alice Hill, in 1971, she became the first woman to become Senior <coughs> Master Sergeant in Air Force Weather, and of course, Chief Weather Observer. So those again are big deals that I didn't know. Back to TV, June Bacon Bercy, 1972, she became the first black person with a meteorology degree on doing TV weather. She was the first black chief meteorologist on TV. After her TV, she ended up going into the National Weather Service, she worked for NOAA, she did research. Uh, she earned the, when you watch TV, you see those little seal, uh, little things on the bottom of the screen, AMS, NWA. She was the first black person to earn that certification. At the weather conference I was at last week in Myrtle Beach, I met her daughter, which is really cool. So mid-1970s, Noah, uh, this of course was after the, the huge civil rights movement, Noah woke up and said, okay, we need to start bringing in more minorities, more black people. In that picture in the mid-1970s, I later, uh, learned, uh, there are three people in here that I later came to know when they were in the middle of their careers. And a lot of those people succeeded and did very well. And that's where this diversity, equity, and inclusion comes into play. You give people an opportunity, you help them a little bit, and they can flourish. Also in the 1970s, there were two African Americans listed. Uh, if you take the National Weather Service, they now have about 120 offices around the country. I did not know that there were two, uh, you would say chief meteorologists, we say meteorologists in charge, MIC. There were two MICs in the mid-1970s. Didn't know it until a couple of months ago. Hidden figures. So back to June Bacon Bercy, mid-1970s, she did this survey of meteorologists in the private uh, sector, military, National Weather Service, NOAA. And what's most significant is that last column, which says there were about 7,000 meteorologists in the country, and out of those 7,000, 110 were black. So 110 out of 7,000, it's like a percent and a half. Keep that number in your brain. 1975, Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi, started an undergraduate program in meteorology. And their claim to fame is basically one out of every three black meteorologists has a degree from Jackson State. So that is highly significant. Next year, they hit their 50th anniversary. Big deal, and they're still going strong. 
One of the people in that picture, second from the right, Dr. Lanzi Lewis, he's the third known African American to get a PhD in meteorology in 1980. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Tom Kearney when I was a grad student at Florida State. Again, I didn't have any concept of the history and where he ranked. He was the fourth person to get a PhD in meteorology. And the fifth person was likely the first black woman to get the meteorology degree, Denise Stevenson Hawk. I didn't know about her until last week. <laughs> so there is just so much stuff that keeps popping up that has, has really never been put in one spot. My buddy Brian, uh, I saw him at the conference last week. In 1988, which I, I started my career in 1987, he became the first degreed African-American male to be a chief meteorologist on TV, 1988. And in some ways it seems so long ago, but in my career that was not that long ago. So a lot of these things really didn't start bubbling and simmering until the 1980s. In the 1990s, I met uh, Paul Trotter in the middle. He was MIC in New Orleans through Katrina, so he has a claim to fame there. Bill Como, he's sometimes listed as the first MIC, African-American MIC in the Weather Service. However, remember that we had the National Weather Service, the Weather Bureau, and the Signal Corps. So depending on which of those three versions you're talking about, it's not necessarily uh, factual. Renee Fair was the first black woman MIC in the National Weather Service. And that was from the mid-1990s into the early 2010s. Howard University, HU, they started a graduate program. So Jackson State had an undergraduate program, Howard started a graduate program, and look at that statistic. 40 to 50 percent of all African Americans with a PhD in meteorology graduated from Howard. That's very significant. Now the downside is the total number since the beginning, since uh, uh, Charles Anderson, it's about 50, 50 to 55 since 1960. But the numbers fortunately are going up at a, at a greater rate. I met John Jones in the mid-1990s. He was the first African-American deputy director of the National Weather Service, so he was the number two guy. That's the highest rank any African-American has achieved within the National Weather Service so far. And then there's this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's funny about my career, funny and odd, is, and I don't say this in an ego sense, but every place I've worked, Albany, Georgia, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Chicago, Illinois, Mobile, Alabama, Rockford, Illinois, every place I've been, I've been the first black degree meteorologist on TV in that place. Uh, and then, of course, here are the first chief meteorologists, black chief meteorologists. But 2018, I became president of the National Weather Association uh, after 42 other people. <laughs> <laughs> it's a start. Dr. Everett Joseph, he's a meteorologist, a PhD. He is director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research within the weather community. That's a big deal. It's a really big position. Um, Felicia Bowser, just three years ago, became the second black woman meteorologist in charge in the National Weather Service. She's in Tallahassee. The second out of 122 offices over like 40 years. The second. Michael Morgan, uh, I served on a, the American Meteorological Council, Society Council with him. He is long title there. Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Environmental Observation and Prediction within NOAA. NOAA is the parent company of the National Weather Service, or the parent agency. That makes him the highest ranking African American meteorologist within NOAA. Danae Carlos, uh, this, Danae's funny, and as it, it, the meteorology community is very small, and those of us with brown skin, it's even a smaller subset, so we know each other. I knew Danae when he was a graduate student. He got his PhD. Uh, he worked through NOAA. He took a, a leadership position in Colorado. Three years ago, I met a woman on the street uh, who was a nurse, and she said, oh, my, 
My cousin, he's a meteorologist in Colorado. Where it is. So again, another key high position within NOAA. So let's talk a few statistics here. This is a, a snapshot from 2019. There were 236 doctorates. Out of the 236, two people identified as black or African American. There were some that didn't report ethnicity or more than one race, but the bottom line is, remember that one and a half percent? Well, 236, two, maybe a little bit more. It hasn't changed a whole lot. So it's still a struggle. Uh, I hope that something like this makes it obvious to younger people that you can do this. We've been doing this for well over 100 years. The American Meteorological Society, which has membership of over 10,000, their membership, 2%, self-identified as black or African American. 10,000 people. Within NOAA, now this is NOAA total, not just the National Weather Service. You look at the breakdown from 2021 of all the different ethnicities, and most of them are pretty close to that center line, current labor force, CLF. What may stand out is white males are way above proportionally, white females are below proportionally, and then everyone else is either a little above, a little below, but overall a little below for African Americans within NOAA. On the positive side, I got this information from the Air Force. The data that I haven't found yet is from the Navy. It's hard to weave your way through these uh, branches to get historical data. But within the Air Force, Air Force weather, 349 black folks, as a percentage, that's about 9%, which sounds really good, but we don't know that they're forecasters or observers. They could be administrators or someone out in the field who really doesn't, I mean, they have one duty to launch a weather balloon, which is not to diminish it, but you just don't know. So here's a fun picture. Remember the, the uh, selfie Ellen took at uh, Oscars. Oscars years ago? Well, this is like that picture. To me, and if you're familiar, if you like jazz, and you know of the picture called The Great Day in Harlem, where you have all these jazz artists who became huge, legendary, this is that picture for meteorology. Uh, the annual conference of the American Meteorological Society, this was last January. I didn't get to go to that one because I teach here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not why I didn't go. But within that picture, I, I'm, I'm happy to say I know most of those people, and if I don't know them by name, I know who they are. There are at least 10, if not 12, PhDs in that picture. And if it is 12, that makes it roughly 25% of all African American PhDs in the country. So that is significant. There's a, a chief meteorologist, Andrew Humphrey, right there, he's in Memphis. There is a, a Bill Parker, he's, so right now within the National Weather Service, 122 meteorologists in charge. There's Bill, he's one, and then there's Felicia Bowser, she's two. And that's it for African Americans. So two out of 122. And then there's some students in here. Uh, I met this doctor. Uh, Dr. Ashton Robinson Cook when he was a high school senior, and now he's a doctor. So it's just really cool to see all these folks who are doing great things. And then Danae Harlis was back there. So this is my next to last slide, and that was the current, this is the past. I finally, my wife and I had the chance two weeks ago to go to the Smithsonian African American Museum. And they had a, one of Benjamin Banneker's almanacs there. And I had known of Benjamin Banneker as uh, being a surveyor for Washington, D.C., the, the design of the city. I, I had known of him as being an astronomer. But it wasn't until I looked a little more closely in his almanac that I noticed he had a daily weather forecast for the whole year. And he did this almanac for several years, starting in 1792. So he was a meteorologist, by some definition. And that coincidentally was the same year that the Old Farmer's Almanac started. And the Old, Farmer, old Farmer's Almanac, as you know, has persisted. This one did not. It, apparently it was very competitive, Almanacs at that time, uh, because that's all people had. So that is my presentation. 
I would love to talk more. <laughs> Questions, thoughts, clarifications? Yes? If that bill passes, how are you going to encourage more people of color or women or whatever to actually step up and take get the degree or look for those jobs? You are. Yeah. We are. <laughs> and, and that's as simple as that. One of the, the joys of my career has been and remains going out and talking to people face to face. And one of the fun parts of my job is I can go to a school and I can say things that the teachers can't say. Uh, so that's, it's a personal mission for me uh, to, to give kids common sense that laws say you can't do that without offending people. Um, so yeah, it is uh, books. I don't, right now, there's Paula back there. Right now, I don't intend to write a book on this. I might actually say, why not? Yeah. Okay, well, I can tell you why not. Uh, the why not is uh, copyright law and ownership of information and photographs. And the amount of work you have to do to get approval to use photographs that are copyrighted. So I, right now, I don't want it. Uh, but for someone who, is, who wants to write a book, even a children's book, the, the information is here. You can pick a, a, a topic, a person, and drill down on that and do a good story about it. So that's a good way to do it. Yes? Can you speak a little more about the transition from weather observation to weather forecasting? Yeah. So National Weather Service now was the U.S. Weather Bureau prior, it was the Army Signal Corps. I, I don't remember the switchover, but initially the, the Signal Corps took weather observations. They were sent by uh, tele, uh, not teletype. Telegraph. Telegraph, thank you. They were sent by Telegraph to Washington, D.C. Washington would make the daily weather map. Washington would make the forecast, and then the local office would disseminate the forecast. So the people who worked in the local offices were not really forecasters. They were simply weather observers. That, I, I don't remember the year when it changed, but in the early 1900s, it began to transition to actually trying to forecast the weather. And it wasn't, no computers, no satellite, no radar. You couldn't do much beyond, here's the weather for the next 12 hours, the next 18 hours. And that didn't really come into play until probably the 1950s. Wasn't the Signal Corps the Signal Corps because there were guys on towers like with flags that indicated what the weather was? I, I'm not sure, but that sounds like a good, <laughs> good <laughs> guess. Yeah. Mr. Seals, in regards to the comments you made about PhDs and why the differences in the PhDs you, you were making in your presentation? So many PhDs, uh, or just bachelor's degrees? I'm yes. Guessing? Yeah, I I chose PhD as a as a benchmark because within most academic fields it is the benchmark, um, and it's something that people can relate to. Even with meteorology, uh, so I have a bachelor's and a master's. When I came to Mobile, my boss. I was given the title Chief Meteorologist. I won't mention names, but the people I worked with did not have meteorology degrees, but my boss decided to call them meteorologists. And I, I went to him and I said, well, they don't have a degree in meteorology. And my boss said, well, I looked up meteorologists in the dictionary and it said a person who studies weather. <laughs> so I lost that battle. <laughs> But commonly within, within TV, the title meteorologist is a person who studies weather. Versus in academia, a meteorologist is you've got to have a bachelor's degree or you have to have military training. Um, did I answer your question? Well, in the sense that that's the highest degree and uh, therefore, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I assume that kind of background is to the top, right? Yeah, so the, the bachelor's degree would be if, if you're not on TV and you want to work as a meteorologist, you basically have to have a bachelor's degree. 
So that's the low end, and PhD is the high end. Thank you. Yeah. Do you think that there was some significance when you talk about the fact that meteorology as a field and forecasting, if you want to look at it that way, as a, a skill in meteorology, could be impacted by both, as far as African Americans, the, the need for it in understanding the world around you, as well as the need for it if you're in farming? Mm -hmm. Do you think that that might be the significance of why the program was in this? The first bachelor's program was in Mississippi at Jackson State, in a state that is known for agriculture. And why that? Does, why did they determine to do a meteorology okay. program at Jackson State versus Alabama and M versus right. any other states uh, with that? So the question generally is. Why Jackson State as sort of the birthplace versus a northern school or somewhere else? I think the answer is more politics and connections and economics than anything else, which is what which is what I tend to find. Uh, even if you go to uh, Tuskegee and the Weather Detachment, a lot of those officers were trained at MIT or northern schools, and then they went to Tuskegee. So, just like now, there is a there were a lot of connections. Um, uh, what I didn't mention, June Bacon Bercy, the first black woman chief meteorologist, she had something to do with Jackson State's program starting. So a lot of cross-pollination, uh, which still continues. Okay, well, we will uh, adjourn. To <laughs> the, I feel like I have to use academic words for a minute. <laughs> We will leave and go over to room 181. 181. Refreshments. I will sign pictures and take pictures and talk more about everything. Thank you so much for your time and share the good word about the. Oh, there will be. Sorry. <laughs>